Welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People, everybody. Well, this next interview ended up being not so we, so we've divided it up into two parts. In this We Chat, Dick Gould, the Stanford University tennis coaching legend, talks about his background in tennis coaching, how he learned to be a great coach, and how sports psychology can help tennis players and business people. Hope you enjoy it. Bye for now. Welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People, hosted by Dr. Allison Rodius, Professor of Sports Psychology at John F. Kennedy University. In each episode, Allison talks to highly successful people in music, sport, and the boardroom. She digs into the mental training techniques that they use to ride out the waves that challenge them in work and in life. So enjoy these We Chats with Brilliant People. So, Dick, I was hoping that we could touch, first of all, on a little bit about what you do now. You've been a player, you've been here at Stanford, head of men's tennis, the coach for 38 years, I think you said, and now you're the director of tennis. So what, is, what does that mean? What, what does your job now entail? When I retired after 38 years of, of serving as Stanford's coach, <clears throat> uh, I want I want to keep working, and I saw a need to do things that a coach just didn't really have time to do, or mm. it, it was really difficult to be a, a fundraiser, to be a uh, facility manager, to deal with the public external relations, and and still do the best job possible coaching. So uh, when it became time for me to retire, then I turned in a job description of what I, how I thought I could contribute to the program and help the current coaches, both men's and women's. And, and so my, my athletic director, my boss, accepted that, and that's what I've been doing for the last 11th year. And next year will be my 50th at Stanford, if you'll have me back for, my, wow. for that year. 50 years at Stanford. I hope they're going to ha- make a cake for you. <laughs> <laughs> my wife won't let me eat it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least a glass of champagne. <laughs> They'll probably be so glad to see me. Not a, <laughs> a little party for that reason. I don't think so. <laughs> Somehow I don't think so. So, um, Dick, as you know, We Chats is all about We Chats, small chats about um, mental preparation because my focus is on sports psychology, performance psychology. So, first of all, a super general question What does mental preparation mean for you as a coach? I think it's a broader context than being as a coach. I think that it's important if you're going to do anything well that you be prepared to do it mm-hmm. as best you can. And that extends beyond the job. It extends to parenting, to relationships, mm. and and of course to performance outside any particular vocation. Mm. So I think we have responsibility to our friends and to our family and to ourselves to always, as a Boy Scout would say, be prepared as mm-hmm. best possible, both mentally and physically for what we do. Um, in the competitive world, in, in any field, sport or whatever it might be, business, uh, the arts if you wish, I guess that can be, can be very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not prepared, you're not going to succeed. Mm-hmm. Then it becomes a matter of what the definition of succeed is. is it, does it mean doing better than you've done before, improving? Does it mean reaching a certain goal? Uh, uh, how do you define success or that goal? Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course the preparation is what allows you to reach whatever that might be. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were, so let, let's take, a, take you back to when you were coaching. When you were preparing to um, help the players here at Stanford, what kinds of things did you do to help yourself be the best coach you possibly could in terms of your preparation? I think it's a lot like parenting. You know, everyone says that, uh, well, to be a good parent, you do this and this and this, and a lot of money's been spent on parenting books. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you read them and real life comes along, you realize that every kid you have in your own family is different one from the other, the sister is different from the brother, and so on, Right. in terms of interests, abilities, and and it's, it's the same thing with the team. Uh, I am dealing with the team, as all of us do in, our, in the workplace, or most of us do in the workplace. 
and your, your success is going to be determined largely by how you relate to people on a team. Uh, the important principles for me, number one, I think uh, one reason, one thing that's really helped me be successful, if you wish, is that I'm very flexible and I'm able to adapt to different situations well. Mm -hmm. And I think in a sport like mine where I don't have to worry such as a football coach having to put an offense in for the next game right. or a defense in for basketball against a certain opponent uh, and therefore everybody has to be there at the same time and have the same level of commitment and, and one cog in a wheel relates to the other one. Tennis is a more individual sport in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I have more flexibility and the luxury of my sport of treating individuals differently. Uh, they, I must be honest with them, I must be fair with them. Uh, but I can treat different people differently. And I think to be successful in any one thing in a business with your fellow workforce or the people that you're in, of, which, of whom you're in charge, that you have to be able to push the right buttons. And you have to be flexible enough that if pushing one button doesn't work for one person, you have to move on and try another button uh -huh. on that same person. And some people can't do that. I think they're not flexible enough to do that. So, so I've enjoyed that part of what I do, and I've, I've failed a lot of times to find the right button for the right person, but mm -hmm. part of the joy and satisfaction I get from what I did when I was coaching uh, was to be able to try to find the right button for the right person uh, to get the right result. I think when people are able to do that, coaches especially, but in general life, when people are able to be flexible and be adaptable, it's almost like they take their ego out of the way. Is there a sense of that, or how does ego play into being a coach for you? Well, well first of all, ego can kill you as a coach. Uh, In what way? Uh, I started out, and I was I was so caught up in what I was trying to do was purely an ego thing. I was trying to be to win a national championship, and Stanford didn't win championships in those days in any in any sport, and I really felt it could be done here. This was in the late 60s and late, into, this, into late the 70s? Late 60s and into the 70s, yes. Okay. And, and uh, my ego got in my way because I was so determined that we were going to do this that uh, and I, was so, I wanted so hard to prove to myself it could be done mm. that it was more a matter of proving to myself we could do something than it was helping someone else. Mm -hmm. it, was almost, it almost took over. Mm. And, and I was new to coaching. I was not a great player. I did play in college. I improved a lot when I had the opportunity to play good players every day. Having grown up on the farm without tennis around, never being able to play in the summer because I was working. Mm. But uh, I improved a lot and quickly and got to be a pretty good player. There was no pro tour in those days, so after college uh, mm. there really wasn't a future as a player. So uh, I became a teacher and, and coach, if you wish. And uh, um, I just felt that that was the right way to go and, and was a, a challenge to me. But the, ch the challenge for me was to prove to myself I could win a national championship more than to try to help someone else. And so and that's the priority, what, the priority was reversed. So that's what got in the way, you said? Yeah, I, Doing became, it for I became a much better coach that when once we won the championship, mm. the championship after seven years we finally won one, I was naive enough to think you could do it in three or four or five years mm. and frustrated by not being able to do such. Right. Uh, that when we finally won it, it got the monkey off my back and off right. my ego. I'd proven to myself I could do it and then I could be more relaxed and better with my players. I also was learning a lot. And uh, as a person in any field, it's important that you keep growing, you keep learning, and you never know it all. And the first thing you have to admit is you don't know it all. And you write that book to be a perfect parent, but it, it's not all things are not all things are all people. Right. So that book can kind of go out the window many times, and <laughs> most times it does. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with coaching. There is no coaching handbook. Right. Uh, every and, and the other thing, you have to be true to yourself. Uh, everyone is different. and. I can't be, when I first coaching, I was coaching football also. Uh -huh. And I figured that to be a football, in those days, the world's best coach was a guy named Vince Lombardi. He coached the Green Bay Packers. And he was known as a really tough taskmaster. Master, and, and many of the football coaches were. But he, in particular, had that reputation. And I figured I had to be him. I had to be Vince Lombardi. Bardi. I had to have his, have his mannerisms to be successful as a football coach. Right. And uh, I learned very quickly that I had to be true to myself. I was not Vince Lombardi. I couldn't be Vince Lombardi. Uh, if I wanted to be Harry Hopman, I wasn't Harry Hopman, who was the, the best coach in the world at the time. And, and so I had to be me. And once I accepted that and, and 
my own inabilities and frailties and strengths, uh, then I became a much, much, much better coach. Did you learn this over time? Did somebody guide you? Did you have a mentor? No, it's just, I'm not very smart, but I'm smart enough <laughs> to know when something's not working. And, right. and when I, uh, and it just happened when we won our championship. I was uh -huh. building toward it, I was getting there, but it just happened that all of a sudden I realized that, hey, you know, we did it, I've gotten that, I've gotten that thing done, now let's just try to be better at what I do and not try to win championships. And ironically, once I did that, the championships kept coming. Uh, yeah. You well, know, you, you, it's it's partly success breeds success. Yeah. But on, and 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 then people be came to know me as someone who could win a championship. They came as champions, they knew they had a chance to do such. But but more than that, I was becoming a better coach and a better uh, better person around the individuals, finding out, as I said, what buttons to push to work with this guy or that guy, and making errors along the way. But mm -hmm. but gradually finding the right one. Uh, another thing, Allison, I was really really proud of. Uh, is that we were always better at the end of the year than we were at the first year. You go through a, a lot of different situations mm. in the workplace or in any field of art or in sport. It's never a smooth ride. It's always a bumpy ride. Uh, you going up a stairway and you take a couple steps up and you slip and go back or you hit the landing and you figure it's the top, but you're not at the top. You're only at a place for now. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to fall back down. And so you have to keep going up their stairs, and, and they keep there can't be an end of those stairs. You have to keep setting that that next step there, like an escalator. Yes, like you're, you're, yes, and and you can't reach at the top. There's always a way you can be better mm -hmm. as a person, as a coach, or or have your players be better. Mm -hmm. And so there is no ceiling, and that's the beautiful thing about sport. There is no magic mm -hmm. one place to be. And that really helped my coaching when I stopped emphasizing trying to win a national championship and started emphasizing more just to get better, be a little better in some phase of what you're doing in your life or your game or mm -hmm. in your practice today or in your skill set than you did yesterday. You did that to your, to yourself as a coach or you did that to the players or both? Well, I think they go hand in hand. You have to recognize it within yourself before okay. you can import that to somebody else. But I think that, that um, it, it's, it's really important to take the, to realize it's a process, not an end result. Mm -hmm. That's important. And, and if you enjoy the process and can make the process enjoyable for others uh, and can relate to them and have your team of workers or athletes or whomever it might be work enjoying what they're doing and, and enjoying the process trying to get better, not be so caught up in, in what you're trying to have them reach, then they'll perform better. Mm -hmm. um, different players, some players need more time off, a lighter workout. Some players need a heavier workout. I don't have to require the same thing from all of them. I can be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, you, tennis is a very difficult sport to coach for this reason. You don't have a tangible measure of your improvement. In mm -hmm. swimming, I had a couple of my own children who were, were very world-class swimmers. And even though they might lose every race in age groups growing up and beyond, uh, they always could better, they could lose every race and better their time, time and yeah. feel good about themselves, yeah. even though they finish last. And and in tennis that's not the case, you, you can't do that, there's not an absolute measure. You get caught up in things like, well, this year I was ranked, last year I was ranked number 20, now I'm ranked number 10, I'm really improving. You may or may not be improving as fast as the next guy, but but your ranking says you are, or you play number four on the team and you say, I'm, when I get to be number two, I'm really getting good. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you, the next year you're number six, you might be a lot better, maybe the team got stronger, maybe other players came in, maybe mm -hmm. other players improved faster than you do. So it, it is a, a, an uphill climb and, and it's hard to measure. You, 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 you measure your achievement by whether you're, you beat someone for the first time or lose to them for the first time, mm. or whether you're ranked higher or lower than you were a few months ago, and that's a false measure. The measure is, are you preparing with your forehand a little better? Are you, are you getting a little better shoulder turn? Are you loading a little better on your rear foot? Are you hitting through the ball a little better? Uh, your serve, your toss, your leg action, your wrist action, all these things are parts, and the parts of the whole make up the whole, and right. you can't measure that so much by whether you're beating one person or not beating one yeah. person, or have a certain rank. And so it's a very difficult sport from that sense. So it's um, more about the process than the outcome per se? Absolutely. 
And in fact, one of our professors here is Tamara Carol Dweck. I'm sure you read her work. Yep. It's, it's, it's yeah. much, it's, it's a process thing. You, you, the worst thing you can do, and, and she's hit this right on, the worst thing you can do is tell someone they have great potential. Because then they, most of them will shy away from trying to reach their goal, what you think they can do because there's too much pressure on them. Right. You, you, are, you, you say in a press conference, this guy is a great athlete, or this guy has great potential as a kiss of death. Right. Because most people then draw back in the shell. They're afraid to try to go to the next step because they've they've been set up for failure. Right. And so I thought that was a, a, a very astute observation that kind of framed my my thinking a lot. I, yeah. I had been doing it that way yeah. because it was only fairly recently in the research. So what about mentally then? So those are the parameters around obviously physical, uh, your forehand or your backhand, your volleys, your serve. There's a a little bit more tangible in a sense in terms of the way that you're measuring improvement. What about the mental side? How do you know if somebody is now mentally stronger? I think the thing that bothered me most of all as a coach was when I had a player who played to protect a lead rather mm. than to uh, play it to a climax. Mm. And I thought uh, when I start, when I would, when I would have a player, I would really get upset with a player, uh, abusive with a player. As a matter of fact, if I felt a player was playing not to lose, mm -hmm. rather than going after his shots, and that takes a lot of confidence. And in my sport, in college, you can talk to a player during a match at any time, as long as you don't inter uh, interrupt the flow of the match. Mm. And so, when I see a player start to lose focus. Uh, then I can I can say I don't say con hey Johnny concentrate I'll say Johnny where are you going to serve this ball or kick it up to his back and and come to net and volley or let's play him down the middle of the next two points as soon as I see a guy start thinking about the result and thinking that hey if I win this point I'm going to get to the next round I've never mm -hmm. been to the semifinals before uh, I can bring him back to reality by just saying let's serve this ball tight into the forehand or something like that, and all of a sudden it brings them back to the real world. Mm -hmm. So I can talk him through these kinds of challenges that uh, otherwise uh, a coach wouldn't have an opportunity to do during a uh, game. You know, and after the event, after the event's over, if you win, you know it all. And right. if you lose, you don't want to hear about it. Right. So it's a hard time to talk to people. I'm, I, 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 I avoid that by talking to them about it as they're going on, as they're playing. Okay. I drive my guys, play, I drive them crazy in practice because I was very vocal, and I, I don't mean vocal in terms of loudness and yelling. Right but very vocal in between points, even during the point. The from the sidelines? Yeah, yeah, talking to them uh, from the court, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it would drive them crazy, and they would hate it. Uh, and, but it, it really helped me keep them focused on what they were trying to do and what they were doing well. Mm. I remember one time, uh, I think it was John McEnroe, who was about four courts away from me, and hit a forehand in the bottom of the net. I'm going, Mac, that's exactly what I want. He looks up at me and said, Coach, he goes back across the courts. He says, Coach, you're crazy. That ball, that was set point. That ball went the bottom of the net. I said, John, that's not the point. The point was you set up so much better than that ball. You did these things we're working about. Now I'll do this a little more, and you, that shot's going to be a winner for you. Yeah. So, you know, trying to keep the kids focused on the right things. It's a little easier to do in my sport than, than many sports because you can talk to them as they're playing. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, tennis is in, really interesting. And, um, I found it fascinating that they allow on the WTA tournament, the coaches, if they... Yeah, it's, it's not... Yes, but it's in, on the changeovers. And right, it's limited, and it has to and, be and, recorded. And can, yeah, and by that time they've lost serve. Mm. So, yeah, and, and I can see a guy going out in the middle of a game or playing, getting tight. Yeah. First of all, the first thing I look at in a big match very first thing when a guy's warming up were his feet because if he's nervous and scared, and I don't like the word nervous, I like the word excited, but if he's if he's nervous or afraid, his feet don't move. He's frozen. Right. So then, uh -huh. quick, okay, let's get those feet going. So the first thing I look at when they warm up in a big match is their feet. Are they moving? Uh -huh. If they're moving well, then they're, they're focused on the job pretty well. Uh, but then again, uh, there are times they, sometimes, uh, in tennis, sometimes when you get nervous, you you overplay. You're playing a guy who's obviously better than you are. So you think you have to ball harder and more on the line. And in the meantime, the guy's won the match without having any balls because you overhit. 
There are other times when you, and, and you should be trying to prolong the point rather than, than beat the guy. You should be trying to make the point last longer. Mm -hmm. uh, take more time in changeovers. Take more time between points. It's get beat, love and love, but be out there an hour and a half. You know, <laughs> uh, that's your object. And and other times you see people so afraid to hit the ball and make an error. Yeah. They just moon moonballing the thing. They don't. They forget to take the chances. And as a coach, I know what the guy or gal can do and not do. If I've been working on that player and doing something, when he goes in the match the first time and tries to do it, he's not going to do it. Right. So I can force him to do it. I can tell him what to do. And then if he messes up, it's my fault, not his. The pressure's off him. Hmm. So that it, it, being able to coach in college during the match is is or even during practice when you're playing and setting up situations to work on. It, I think it's valuable. It drives the guys crazy. The beauty of it all is, in about a year and a half or two years, that same player, and, and our better coach would be faster. That's about how long it took me to get something really new across, making a backcourt player, a certain volley player. Uh, it took about a year and a half or two years to get them to make that a true part of their game. Mm. And then I would start to say something to them about how to play the next point coming up based on the score or where they were. and. Uh, uh, and before I could say it, they'd be doing it, and then I'm just and then I'm really feeling good about myself because finally they're thinking the way I'm thinking about how this point should be played and what they can do, and having confidence to execute that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's that was really a thrilling part for me. Mm -hmm. First, when I first started coaching, I was afraid to say too much during the first of all, players are all better than I was. Yeah, and had you know had, had so a lot of them had good success on, on the tour already before they came to Stanford and. And uh, I was hesitant to say anything to them, but then I realized, hey, they're human. There are things they do better than others, and some things better than other things they do. And, and my job is to make those things better. Yeah, and yeah. They have a strength to make that better. So, so I, I never, very honestly, I never really paid much attention to sports psychology per se mm -hmm. or sports psychology. I didn't want someone else talking to one of my players and getting in their heads mm -hmm. because I knew what I wanted them to do. I didn't want them thinking about something too much. So I was reluctant to have anyone ever go to a sports psychologist. I felt that was kind of my job. Mm -hmm. I knew the kid better. Um, and, and I just, uh, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I, I just felt one voice is enough right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, if the, uh, what if the player wanted to talk about you or needed oh, to I'm talk sure. about you? I'm sure they did. They, they, they tell, me where, <laughs> tell me where to go all the time. Because that, that's one, um, you know, coaches have a, a similar philosophy where they want to be that one person, but um, sometimes it helps if they have a n completely neutral person to talk yeah, I, to. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, okay, that's fair. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think I was pretty easygoing, and mm -hmm. I think the players felt they could come to me and they could tell me where I was right and where I was wrong. Um, uh, my approach oftentimes be ask someone. Mm. What do you think about this? And then, you know, if you ask right, pretty soon you get them saying what you want them to say. Mm. and Or you can rephrase it, so pretty soon they're framing in their own mind what you want them to be thinking mm -hmm. of. So uh, those little mental games, if, they're, if, if they are, ba on, if there's a good basis for them that said right, can be, can be played right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, so I was... I'm not saying that it would have been not more helpful or not, but I was very comfortable just doing it myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what about now? Now you've left coaching. Is there, um, you know, do you see a place for mental skills coaches and sports psychologists in tennis? Oh, I, yeah, I think there definitely is a place for it in, in everything. Uh, I, I think, I, I would say especially in this sense, there is society, 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 in society is such a tremendous pressure nowadays yeah. on young people. Yeah. And that carries over not just the sport, but in everything they do. And their manifestations of dealing with pressure in sport are very similar to how their manifestations are going to be dealing with their pressure in their job or in school. And leading to depression and all kinds of things because the expectations are so high mm -hmm. by, by society or by their parents, whatever it might be. And I think there's a tremendous need for this uh, in general. And you read about all these suicides in our area in particular, where it's such a high achieving area. It's tr it's traumatic, and it's 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 really really mm -hmm. difficult uh, 
And, and what causes this? It's, so much of the time it's parental expectations, not always, but sometimes it is. Sometimes the kids will put it on themselves, but usually it's mm -hmm. parental based. And it, it, so I think that uh, that a coach, a mental coach in general, can be really, really helpful. And I think that might be in sport, it might be in in business, full-grown adult. Uh, uh, I think the biggest single thing we have to watch for is depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I put too much pressure on a player as a coach, then of course that's going to cause some depression too. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know what a kid can do and what he could achieve. Uh, and if I put too much pressure on him, it's gonna, there's going to be a backlash. He's going to run from mm -hmm. So, Did you know, ever notice um, a difference between the players who have now gone on to be professionals and several of them, I know you've coached, who are great professionals and some of them are retired now you touched on obviously you, you touched on John McEnroe um, did you ever notice a difference in their mental strength strategies preparation you know, they're, they're, everyone is different everyone is different and I, I don't if you took uh, I've had quite a few people reach at least the quarters of Wimbledon as an example or the semis or the mm. finals and and all these guys were different uh, different backgrounds different levels of family involvement, um, all very different personally. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one mold, but uh, most of them could compete pretty well. Mm -hmm. Most of them loved. I think this is the thing that, that I was able to impart pretty well, would be the, the love of putting it on the line. Uh, mm -hmm. The challenge, the, the challenge, the, the joy of the challenge, mm -hmm. to be able to put it on the line. And our teams were always, always without exception, better at the last part of the year than they were at the first. Mm. And I think that part of that was because my philosophy was is, it is all a process. And I don't want them getting too carried away with success early in the season or a failure early in the season. And, and I was able to impart a sense amongst the team, which is really powerful when it's amongst the whole team, not just an individual. Uh, that, hey, we're getting better, we're getting better. I love what you guys are doing. Can't wait to get into this, this competition. And just seeing what you guys can do. I can't wait to put it on the line. I can't wait to, you know, and, and building this, building and building, mm -hmm. building, but not all at once, you know, doing it over time. Mm -hmm. And and we really were good at peaking at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it was the style of play that we coached because uh, I earned my wings, if you wish, by advocating being act proactive, not reactive. Uh, it drives me crazy when I see guys stand on the baseline trying to out-rally someone. Although it's a stage of tennis you learn growing up. Mm -hmm. but when I get in a 17, 18, 19 year old kid, he's big enough and strong enough by that time to be able to serve and ball it. He's be able to attack the return and come in. He can cover the net. And if he hasn't been taught the basics of net play, then I'll teach it to him. And I'll insist he get up there. And uh, and uh, that's that that became a lost art for a while. Everyone started playing ten feet behind the baseline. Mm -hmm. But now you see players, if not, even if they're not serving ball, you still, I think serving ball has is going to come back a little bit. Not, well, not it, every point. But, I think it. I think it is. But but uh, even a more subtle example of that is that players are not just content to stay back and rally, rally the guy. Now they're coming in quicker off the ground. They're playing close to the baseline. Yeah. Uh, that's why Federer, I think, is fairly successful against the doll. And doll so far back, Federer is able to come in and, and get end the point a little quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Djokovic plays so much close to the baseline and, and takes the return so early that you know he, it's, he's a harder guy to to get to put pressure on because mm -hmm. he's putting it on you. Um, I, I think that style of play, I think, uh, helps helps you because it. You're in a more aggressive mindset. Uh, you're trying to make something happen and let it happen, then rather than sit back and let it happen to you. You're trying to get, make the first strike, if you wish. And so that's an easier style to coach in terms of uh, we won our championship with that style of play, player. And uh, the game was changing when I left it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the last championship one of my guys won was uh, in singles, it was uh, Bob Bryant. Mm -hmm. 
and I worked really hard to try to get him to serve volume more, but he won that championship staying back primarily. And it was the first of my players who won a championship not serving a volume, mm. an individual championship. Mm -hmm. And it, so the game was changing. Mm -hmm. And so it was a natural time for me to get out as well. I mean, he must be a pretty good volleyer now uh, doing his playing doubles. Well, yeah, he is, but it's really interesting. Mike doesn't have as good a serve. Right. But he's better in the transition area for the volley, much better. Mm -hmm. If I were going to ask them to serve and volley, Mike would do a better job of that than Bob. Now, Roscoe Tanner was a good serve and volleyer, mm. but he had a big serve. Right. In fact, in college, I wouldn't let him serve a first serve in practice. I'd make him serve only second serves because he'd have tougher volleys then. I still wouldn't serve and volley off it, but that would make him have tougher volleys and it would improve his volley if he had tougher volleys to hit. Yeah, I think I think it's fascinating um, seeing Federer for lots of. I'm a huge Federer fan, and and seeing him in uh, you know changing his game and doing those serve and volley more. Obviously, when he well, had Edberg, he used, Edberg, to, he used would, to do it. He used to it more than he does now. Right. When he first started, but then he's come. On. He's come back to it a little bit. Come back to a little yeah, bit more, especially yeah. against certain guys. Yeah. And I think I, th I think you're gonna. Uh, I, you think it's gonna come back even more. I think so. I don't know that you can do it. You know, the, the strings are different. The courts are a little slower. Mm -hmm. uh, the equipment's better. Yeah. But realize the only, there are only two guys in the world who are any good who are serving and volleying yeah. uh, when Sampras won his last major. And everyone else is playing from the backcourt. Yeah. And Sampras won serving and volleying. Yeah. And so it still could be done. And everyone else is playing the backcourt. I think Rafter might have been serving and volleying. Somebody. He's the only other guy in that. In that in those couple of years, it was not playing exclusively backward, and yet Sanford still proved it could be done. It would be remiss of me to ask uh, your thoughts on Andy Murray. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know Andy. I I, I think uh, from what I've seen, he's, he's a very intriguing person. Uh, I would like to know him a little better. Yeah. Um, I. He's, he's surely done a nice job with yeah, himself. Yeah, for sure. Won in pretty much every service now, pretty close. Yeah. Uh, he's continued to get good. He's, he's, he's unfortunately, his time in Nadal and, and Federer and mm -hmm. Djokovic, but he's right there with him. Mm -hmm. He's worked hard to get there. Uh, he's got that monkey off his back. He's got the monkey off his back. Yeah. yeah <laughs> just, no, that's true. And, yeah. and uh, I, I think one thing that's the, the, a quote that really stuck with me, Al, Al Davis was a coach of the Oakland Raider football team when right. they won the Super Bowl. I'll never forget a quote, and it's really influenced me a lot. Uh, and it was after he won the first Super Bowl, it was the start of the next year's season, and the writers at their first press conference, someone asked him, well, Al, you won the thing last year, are you going to win it again? And Al just kind of looked at it, and he quoted from Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> He said, well, you know, the Red Queen told Alice that you have to run as fast as you can to get somewhere. But once you get there, you got to run twice as fast to stay there. <laughs> and so I think that being a summary, I think that the things I'm most proud of in my career are, number one, we always were playing our best at the end of the year, no matter what level of team I had. Mm -hmm. Always were playing our best. People would you could just sense it. They'd say, oh, here comes Stanford. And uh, the other thing was that, that uh, uh, we continued to get better, mm. and we had a long run of success. We didn't, we didn't drop, we just kept getting better and having better and better results. And I think I'm, I'm really proud of sustaining that, and I think that was obvious because we kept running faster. Um, I, I, as I more I coached, the more I didn't want someone to say, hey, that guy's been there 20 years, 30 years, you know, he's just coasting now. Uh, and so therefore I, I really tried to have a project that had never been done, do something never been done before, mm -hmm. every four or five years. Or if it had been done before, do it at such a level that it had never been done at that level before. And, uh, and I also enjoyed that ability to be creative in my office outside of my time on the court. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example, this stadium, uh, we put $20 million in this thing. And I didn't get a penny of help from my athletic department or mm -hmm. from the university. We raised every penny ourselves. Our program now is completely endowed for the men at almost $20 million. Uh, my position, the head coach, the women's coach, or excuse me, the assistant coach, the uh, scholarships, the operating budget, it, it's 18.